Welcome to the show both feared and revered by Man and Beast, the Helios blog. Today, Hassan Abi asks, does Kamala Harris have a chance? The reason she's alone is because she's difficult. Women are not accepting the bare minimum. Women fuck men they respect. All the women who say things like, I'm strong, independent, I don't need no man, like, y'all impress me. Women just gaslight each other and say what they want to hear. buddy all right am i coming in good i can't see you oh, oh well I, i'll share my screen you're not gonna pop open the cam show us no, your face I, no i need to show i've been on the majority report i've done that already. i know i thought you did a face yeah. reveal yeah i did a couple weeks ago but uh i can't believe the, you gave the, your face reveal to majority report and not here that's bull the last time i like called i was like on the phone or something but i can go on after i show the stuff that i want to show people but uh yeah this is the copium stream let me pull okay. up which so i can see what people are saying yeah all right the copium stream is upon us so this is foundational this is not this is not felix this is energy momentum what do you mean i'm not a boomer i'm a zoomer i'm the only zoomer i'm the first zoomer an analyst yeah, but yeah it's true yeah so i tried to get into this like quickly last time yeah i'm a zoomer i was born in 2002 so this is um a message for zoomers out there you can do whatever you want but so hassan got me on here he wanted me to talk like kind of give the case for why um kamala can still win and uh, i'm just gonna go over the cuck nate silver model right here so here we go the reason why people are kind of flipping out right now, number one, because um, her campaign is um, awful and really stupid. And number two, but the forecast is like insanely close right now. I think that his thing, it's like basically 50-50. Everything's showing 50-50 right now. So uh, like she's not really in like a dominant position that Biden or like, um, uh, I'm going to go to the standard map. It's the stupid woke uh, map that he has here. Can you also zoom um, in on the on your screen a little bit? Yeah, sure. So we can see it better. We yeah. got old people in here. Not myself. I'm yeah. me and Felix are both uh millennials with the with the zoomer brain. We're the most Gen Z millennials out there. Yeah, you guys are. I yeah. you guys are honorary um Gen Z. This is not Felix. This is not Felix. I'm Jewish, but I'm not Felix. <laughs> This is th this is an anti-Semitic community. So. Yeah, this is an anti-Semitic community. I'm gonna cancel you guys. I'm gonna go with the very wise. I'm gonna catch you all. No. Um. So yeah, Michigan leading blue is copium. So uh, this is the current map that he Nate Silver has. This is kind of the consensus right now. And as you can see, uh, I think well, this doesn't show the electoral votes, but the basic state of play for everybody. Everybody's saying that it's all copium. This is like this is. I mean, this is. I disagree with a lot of the stuff that he um he ad he adds a lot of pollsters in here that I don't think are um uh like things you should add. I had an article about that, but like there are a lot of who's in chat. Okay, Michigan and Wisconsin may flip right. Yeah. So uh whatever. Okay, everybody I'm gonna have to stop paying attention to you people. Yeah, um, yeah. don't don't pay attention to yeah. chat. You know this already. Yeah, I gotta lock in. Okay. Uh but so basically the state of play for this election, uh, just to go over the really basic stuff for like the stupid people, I guess. There are like six uh like seven or so states. It used to be six, now it's seven states that are like legitimately important. Uh there is Arizona and Nevada, which are the southwest states, Georgia and North Carolina which are the southeast states, and then you have the three uh, Great Lakes states up north. All the other states are, like, varying degrees of not competitive at all. Like, they're not really worth paying attention to. Yeah. Florida, Texas, like, I wouldn't say. She's not in a position where those are going to be relevant at this point. Uh, I very much live in the world where, like, the New York Times poll had Trump up by 13 in Florida. That, I think, was, um like, feels a little accurate, like, th compared to the ones that show up more competitive. But... So, like, the way that things have settled, basically, is that Kamala has not had great polling in Arizona or Georgia, contrary to what some people thought. Like, it's part of long-standing trends we've been seeing with Democrats um, not doing particularly well with non-white voters uh, compared to past years and doing a lot better with white voters. Yeah, my profile picture has been Berlusconi for years. Um, uh, yeah, nobody... Who, are people on Reddit saying that, like, Texas and Florida are going to flip? I, I mean, I don't know. But, um... Stop reading chat. Not. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but, Lock um, in. Lock okay, in. Okay. Yeah, so the path for, like, the path for Democrats always has been, like, they get to, like, 230 or so electoral votes with all the blue states here, like the Northeast, Illinois, the um, these mountain states and the West Coast and Hawaii. 
that gets them to a position where if they get Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, yeah. they get to exactly 270 electoral votes. It's the bare minimum you need to win, but that has always been the path. It was the path for Biden when he was in the race because he polled very poorly with white, especially poorly with non-white voters, but he was do- holding a little tougher with white voters. Kamala has improved a lot among non-white voters, maybe not to like the extent she may need to win, but she's definitely like competitive in Georgia, North Carolina, in the way that Biden wasn't. But those are kind of, at this point, don't look to be the ones that will decide the race. These three will, like Michigan, with Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. And the kind of the state of play that was pushed, I think, by a lot of the centrist pundits who were really angry over Josh Shapiro not being picked was there was an assumption that Wisconsin and Michigan were kind of leaning towards her, like kind of solid for her, but that Pennsylvania would be the one that would decide the race. There was tons of focus on Pennsylvania, a lot of polling there compared to other places. And her, like, when we got like a trillion polls there and they all showed either like basically a tied race or one with her up by like three or four points. And that's kind of a variance you'd expect if she was leading in that state. So like, I think coming out of the debate when like the race kind of stabilized a little bit in her favor, she looked to be on a solid path to getting 270 electoral votes. And that was kind of, I wrote an article like last month that I've promoted a lot and I still fundamentally do believe in that said like the race I don't think was a toss up. I don't think it's 50. I I didn't think and I still kind of don't think it's 50-50 in the way that people have like kind of just defaulted to saying it is. Yeah. But that wait, rely but, that, wait, can yeah. we can we stop for a second so yeah, sure. your your analysis on this or your confidence on this comes from your special elections coverage right like you're yeah you're looking at special elections and you're looking at like active voters like yeah, real indeed. enthusiastic voters and mm-hmm. how and and you know normal i guess in air quotes voters and how they participate in these other like off-season elections yeah. which heavily favor the democrats even the midterms uh in 2022 also showed yeah a lot of motion for the Democratic Party at a time when, like, if you just simply looked at the living circumstances and how primaries are supposed to work as, like, a, a approval rating for the uh, administration, at a time when they're experiencing negative real wage growth, like, it was expected that there would be a, there would have been a red wave. Yeah. And yet that did not happen. Um, yeah. Democrats won at least one race, uh, like a major race, a governor or Senate race. They won at least one race in all seven of the, all six of these states. North Carolina didn't have any statewide elections in 2022, but they won the Senate race in Georgia. They won the Senate and governor's race in Arizona. They won all the governor's races in Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Or they they did lose the Senate race in Wisconsin and the governor's race in Georgia. But what was really encouraging for them and what I thought like would put them in a solid position, what I still am kind of leaning on, is that their results in 2022. And yeah, the polls were accurate in 2022. That is something somebody mentioned that. And I think that that's worth considering. I'll get into like the idea. There's sort of a cope on the right that uh, the polling is biased against Trump and that Kamala only having a small uh, lead means that Trump is guaranteed to win by a large margin. But that's not true. Uh, At least that's not guaranteed to happen. It's not any more likely. Yeah, polls. You don't know that they'll be more accurate, whatever. But so specifically, the results in the in the three midwestern states here were very very strong for democrats even compared to the rest of the country they won all the statewide elections in michigan by double digits or close to double digits they won the governor's race in pennsylvania by 15 points the fetter chud won by five in his senate race which i thought was a really like stunning result they won the governor's race in wisconsin (laughs) by three and in the senate race in wisconsin against an incumbent who has won two terms ron johnson they only lost that race by one point while running a very left-wing candidate there mandela barnes i don't know if you're like familiar with him but he was one of the more left-wing candidates of 2022 and he i thought he did very well given the circumstances they especially since he was very underfunded they um well the democratic uh, party had different priorities at that time they had yeah. to, they had to funnel as much money as possible to like races yeah. that they were going to lose by 20 points on you yeah, know in florida yeah well yeah 2022 is before gaza and i'll get to that in a little bit so that could be a factor but i mean at the same time one interesting thing in michigan is that um in whitmer's race uh when she won by 11 points she actually saw some slippage in the muslim areas in dearborn and hamtrack be- hamtrack however it's pronounced but that wasn't because of gaza it was actually um over um social issues because there are a lot of like conservative kind of imams who have a lot of influence 
in yeah. those areas who didn't like that she was more pro LGBT and important note to add in electoral trivia is that a lot of the Muslim population trend. in the United States of America pre 9-11 was definitely at least like I can't speak on their conservative social values but certainly were resilient Republican voters and yeah, post 9-11 they swung heavily in the Democratic Party's direction for understandable reasons yeah but they were they were always they were sort of an interesting part of the coalition that was definitely over um uh cultural stuff foreign policy because democrats were less pro Iraq war there was a anti-interventionist tendency among mainstream liberals back in the 2000s that you don't see now in the party in a way like a lot of the shit that like people like like people got angry at noah cohen the other week because they said like oh they're spending all the money in israel but they're not spending any to help with the hurricane disaster relief they're like oh no that's conspiratorial thinking you can't say that that's the shit obama said in 2008 he was running on like uh uh, let me be clear, we need to do regime change uh, at home, and we need to do uh, nation building in uh, Detroit instead of in uh, Afghanistan. I, like, that was basic liberal um, kind of ideology. And then I think yeah. with Biden, who is kind of an ideological Cold Warrior neoliberal, who um, he's really embraced these people. And, and I would say in a way, because the way that he's connected Trump and liberal like disdain and anger towards Trump as part of a larger neoconservative interventionist foreign policy thing where he like will explicitly talk about fighting Putin and Hamas and Trump as one of the same thing. That tendency that used to exist among liberals to be um, less interventionist is not the case now. Uh, there's at the elite level, there's been a substantial. Oh, you just shift. you mean to, yeah to to. Yeah. To say something here, you're talking about the Democratic Party. You're not talking about the base yeah. of support overall. No, not the base at all. No, yeah. not the, the base. base the base certainly, even amongst, I would say, the Republican Party base of uh, support, has never been as invested in like no wars as they have now. Like I yeah. would say that even the Republicans. Sorry, I'm falling asleep right now. Um, nothing really has been said yet. For one reason or another, I think like mainstream media will cover it as like they are pro Putin. But even even in terms of like Ukraine and definitely a similar attitude exists for Gaza as well, where they're just like, I don't want the like, I don't I don't want to hear about it. At least I don't want to hear about it. Like, I don't want it to keep yeah. happening and I don't want my tax dollars going to it is the prevailing attitude, I would say, broadly, which Donald Trump, I think, expertly captured in 2016 as he presented himself as a peaceful dove against Hillary Clinton that he yeah. successfully with not much, uh, you know, not much momentum. He didn't really need to do too much successfully presented Hillary Clinton as a war monger, which she was. Now, yeah. they're trying to do that right now, but uh, the Trump administration, I, I mean, the Trump campaign is, like, woefully incompetent. Like, they yeah. are so unimaginably incompetent that they're failing to do that. J.D. Vance, I think, did a better job, I can't believe I'm saying this, yeah. than Donald Trump did during the VP debate, where he very successfully presented that. And it reminded me that, like, a competent Republican would be able to make light work of the Democratic Party if he didn't yeah. have, like, the January 6th stink on him, if he wasn't seen as like such a narcissistic loser if uh people didn't remember some of the worst aspects of his uh administration uh there would be no question right now uh, as to who was winning the race it yeah, would absolutely some, be uh, the republican there, party one poll that really sticks with me from last year is there was a poll that showed like haley leading biden by 20 points which um but at the same time there is also a poll that showed um uh Kamala leading Vance by 21 that was last month. So I think I think moderate republicanism nationally is uh can be very popular. I I am a little skeptical and I I'm going to write something about this soon that people explicitly trying to model themselves after Trump. I don't even if they aren't Trump, I don't think that they might do well because Trump and we've seen this in polling recently, has an advantage over a lot of other Republicans in that people see him as experienced and a strong leader in the way that someone like Cary Lake or even DeSantis doesn't really poll well. So strangely enough, and contrary to a lot of conventional wisdom, we've, we've seen at the Senate level a lot of the Trump acolytes have polled a lot worse than him despite kind of hypothetically maybe being more palatable in their background because they lack the credibility and experience that people think Trump has, which I think is something that people didn't really expect and could be a big problem for them long That people think long term. Someone trying to do Trumpism without having Trump's motion is Ron DeSantis. And we all know how that went at the national yeah. stage. Yeah. So anyways, so, 
Yeah, no, yeah. Trump is Trump is the Trump is white man's Barack Obama in that respect. Like, if you put a Pete Buttigieg style person out there, or if you put like a Josh Shapiro trying to present themselves as Barack Obama, literally, but failing to be Barack Obama, I think people are not going to respond positively to that in the way that they did to Barack Obama himself. Yeah, I mean, uh, Shapiro does have a very strong electoral record, which is kind of a wrinkle in that. But I mean, he DeSantis did too, and we saw how that went. But basically, going back to what I said, about I, I, I'm talking about yeah. like Shapiro and. Uh, nationally i i feel oh, yeah, like yeah i could i feel like that. especially if you very very weak opponent yeah especially with um like when you consider like the same middle of the road neoliberal policies that you you put forward like if your agenda package is not even remotely addressing the concerns of the broader electorate you know the middle class i feel like you're just not going to you're just not going to be able to communicate that in a successful way unless you're a once in a lifetime charismatic leader like Barack Obama. Yeah, or Joe Biden, obviously. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. But so kind of going back to what I was saying that this is why I still I would still say I think that she just is going purely fundamentals, nothing about what her campaign is like now. I don't think that she's running a good campaign whatsoever. I really Ouch. disagree with a lot of her decisions. I think her people are inept and don't deserve trust. Uh, but basically, in 2022, we saw these very, very strong results for Democrats in these three Midwestern states where they won statewide races at this, at, at least some level in all three. And we, the causal reason for that, which is this went against expectations that people had that the Rust Belt would trend to the right over time as, after 2016. This was kind of a different like direction than people expected uh the main reason for that is abortion and social issues for whatever like what people miss about these three states up here the white voters in these states even the moderates is that they are largely socially liberal pro-abortion uh like not necessarily too like crazy about trans issues not very evangelical like white voters are in the south so we have seen like lasting democratic strength with crackers in the north not really in the South. They've had issues with rural voters in the South, but in the North, they've remained strong. So that provides Kamala a path if Trump can't really uh, do particularly well with um, uh, like non-white voters, rural Southern voters, voters nationally in general. Um, she could still win in these states and win the election by holding strong with white voters in these areas. That is what polling has sort of shown, and I'm going to get to the Washington primary. The, the real heads are going to know about this. This is kind of like a bit of a cheat sheet for the election ahead of time. For the past number, basically the case here is that, and I'm going um, to the split ticket page for this, which is their very good website that have a lot of detailed analysis for elections like this. Since 2018 or so, um, the primary elections in Washington like Washington in the chat, you know, rise up. The way Washington holds primaries is This that, is your 13 keys, the Washington primary. Yeah, this is my Alan Lickman shit. This is like what I'm on. But it's real. It's not like the 13 keys. But from 2018 onward, what we've seen in Washington, in, in August, Washington has basically a preliminary general election where they have both candidates of both parties on the ballot in a jungle primary where both part, oh, voters of both parties vote in the same ballot line and essentially hold like the election for congressional and statewide races beforehand. I'll zoom in a little bit more here. And so you can uh, tally up all the results of all the candidates in all these races and you can get a kind of a statewide result in Washington months before the rest of the country. And Washington is a bluer state and the rest of America um, is always going to vote Democratic, has voted Democratic in all these years. But you can, uh, if you shift the results to the right, kind of to the same extent that um, Washington is blue, you can see how the extent that Washington is blue in these elections maps closely, and at least since 2018, to what the national environment will be like. So in 2018, Democrats did very well, which corresponded to them doing very well nationally. In 2020, this was contrary to polling, uh, which showed Democrats leading in a landslide. They did a lot worse than 2018. They only won in Washington by 14 points, which, um, what do you mean you hate this analysis? Is this real? Shut up. So in 2020, they only won Washington by a margin that would indicate them only winning nationally by a small degree. And that's what happened, which was contrary to what polling showed. The polling at the time, at the time of August 2020, incorrectly showed a very strong Democrat Democratic lead. lead. Yeah, yeah, and it was wrong. Then two years later, you see in 2022, Democrats win in Washington uh, roughly by 10. 
this goes against the consensus that people have then that it'll be a Republican blowout. This isn't a really good result for Democrats, but it indicates roughly a neutral year. Like this is uh, like about rep represents about a two point Republican lead and then they end up winning by two. So if you want to be very rough at this, you can just say 2018 onwards, you'd subtract 12 or 13 points from the Washington results. And that's basically what you get nationally. The thing that was really noticeable about 2024, if you notice here, this is the best result Democrats in 2024 this year, this August, Democrats had the best result in the Washington primary they've seen since 2018, and the second best result they've had since 2008. Their numbers in 2024 were two points better than what they got in 2020, which was the year that they won nationally. So if you go purely off of this, if you do the very rough 12-point shift, this would indicate a year where Democrats win by roughly four points, and the nat like they have a four-point advantage at the generic ballot. So if Dem that would be in that which is um that would be about enough for Kamala to win not by a huge margin but by enough to win probably most of the swing states over 270 electoral votes it, this isn't like very complicated or grasping for straws it's just taking the amount that Washington is and this is going to get more insane soon th this is um taking the amount that Washington voted for Democrats um shifting it about to how much Washington leans Democratic relative to the country and you get something close to the national result here. So okay. what this indicates is like the country leaning more democratic than it did in 2020. Yeah. No, this is post 2018, not 2016. Yeah, um, 2016 is a different case and we can get we'll get to that in a bit. And there's another way of analyzing it that actually looks even better for Democrats that accounts for 2016 kind of being a bit off here. So um so the thing I the thing I'm looking at uh that is worrisome, I guess, is the reality that Joe Biden won by plus two, right? Like Joe Biden underperformed five. the polls. He won by 4.5. This is the congressional ballot. Oh, the congressional ballot. Okay, he won yeah. by 4.5. The problem with Joe Biden, I think, and the thing that Kamala Harris doesn't have is the reality that, like, I think, what, 46% of the broader electorate consider Kamala Harris to be too liberal? Yeah. And why do they consider that? It's because she's a black woman. Like, not yeah, to get all MSNBC on everyone's asses here, but that's the reason why they're saying yeah. that, right? That's the heuristic people have. Finally. So, there we go. <laughs> the the comment was funny. This guy is a political poem reader. Yeah, he uh, he's just saying dumb crap. Like, dumb random crap. Again, you guys tell me if... Uh, if you think it's bullshit or not have i'd agree with that and i and it's in a sense that does make me kind of understand why she's trying to play the dissenter a bit more i think that she could do it a bit more like intelligently but the basic idea i sort of do get because she's like as far as voters are concerned she's kind of already maxed out her liberal points on account of being a black woman but at the same time there are liberal policies that are just popular so like yeah. there's a give and take here and i don't agree with a lot of what like you don't need to do a rally with liz cheney you just need to kind of present yourself like a strong leader which is the problem that people have yeah I, and and i think more important than that she needs to stand on uh she needs to identify what the what the problems are that many Americans are facing and address those problems with like direct policy prescriptions. One aspect of this campaign that was uh, fairly successful early on that caught me by surprise even was Kamala Harris putting forward the notion that she would tackle price gouging yeah. for grocery prices. This policy has been relatively resilient regardless of the the consistent counter messaging from the trump administration it's actually only grown in popularity yeah um and it shows up in polling uh yeah. as well you can you, when when independently polled on kamala harris is like tackling price gouging which i think was like very effectively communicating a a policy that americans would otherwise be like very against price caps yeah. like price controls they were very much on board with it when it was represented as tackling price gouging yeah. and people love it uh, when nick did it People loved the pri the original like in like the seventies. People loved that. Shit. It made them yeah. very popular. So that's the thing that I look to. Like uh, there was another poll I saw recently that showed I think like uh, when when asked the same exact group uh, two different questions of the same exact policy, Americans were very much on board when you said Kamala Harris is going to tackle uh, price gouging. It was profoundly popular when they yeah, asked. That's an excellent point. I thought you made the other day. Yeah. 
when uh, when when asked about the exact same issue with negative framing, a fr like framing that Americans are primed to feel is negative price caps, they they found it to be profoundly unpopular. Yeah, and that's the that's the point that a lot of Americans should understand, but they uh, choose not to for some reason. Uh, I think our media diet contributes to that. Which is that, um, here, I'm trying to pull up that data right now. I'm, I don't know yeah. where it is. but Yeah, but, this is very consistent. And it, it gets to the point that, like, like you said, people will disagree, um, like will have completely different views on the same policies depending on how it's framed. Public opinion is a lot more malleable than people think, not even in the, term, in the sense that you can outright um, change people's minds, but you can make something that would otherwise be unpopular sound popular if you present it the right way. Yeah. It's just, it's, yeah. Surrendering to your uh, your opponent's framing is the mo is the quickest way to lose if you want. Yeah. It, it, in it, there are so many examples of this. Someone in the chat brought this up as well. It's Affordable Act versus Obamacare. And also the other thing that I brought up was about polling. Whenever someone asks me about polls, I always point out to the reality that American voters believe things fundamentally at odds with one another. This is why party messaging on issues matter quite a bit. If you concede to the right wing framing on immigration, you lose. And obviously that poll showed it was uh, Asian Americans and how they see immigration. 73% of Asian Americans say allowing immigrants who came to the country illegally as children to remain in the U.S. and apply for legal status is an important policy goal. 64% say creating a way for most immigrants currently in the country illegally to stay here legally is an important goal. While simultaneously, 62% say increasing deportations of immigrants currently in the country illegally is an important goal. So... That's what it is. Like they it's just framing, yeah. People are not as ideological as people in DC like to think. People okay, well, again, guys, we're going to end the video there. I hope you got some good information out of this. Um, as you heard, I didn't have much to say because, well, I didn't really have much to say. I let the, the experts talk because, uh, well, you know why. So... Anyway, hit the like, hit the sub, hit all for notifications, buy my books at bit.ly slash Helios Books. Uh, and of course, if you would like coaching services, you want me to teach you how to be better at getting girls, well, uh, there's my coaching services and my email, that's the Helios blog at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, guys, especially if you listen to the end, I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.